name of our Lord Jesus Christ, and good morning. It's uh, wonderful to have you all here with us. Uh, if you're a visitor, we welcome you. Also, uh, in our pews, we have these things called friendship pads, and we ask that sometime during the service, if you could just fill it out and then pass it down. That allows us to know that you're here and also allows your neighbor to know uh, who they're sitting next to and who you're sitting next to. Uh, I have one announcement up here. Um, today at 10.30, Frank Yamada, president of McCormick Theological Seminary, will discuss the Bible in 2040, Biblical Interpretation in the 21st Century in Room 209. Uh, all are invited. If you don't know where 209 is, uh, if you ask somebody, I'm sure they'll point it out. I'm also glad that I'm just now realizing that the president of McCormick is here this morning. Wasn't nervous about my sermon until this moment now. <laughs> And I know Jim has an announcement for us, if he'd come forward. I'm always really impressed with how much stuff is going on in this church behind the scenes. And something that has come up over the course of the past month or so, that's just really coming into focus right now, is the possibility of a few, a lot of people from this congregation participating in one of the Presbyterian denominational ministries that brings um, clean water to the world. Um, we have a, a visitor, a new friend in the congregation, uh, Pete Emerson. Can you just stand up for a moment so you can find him up? He is coming up to the region here from Texas. Um, and he has been working with um, uh, Clean Water for the World for a number of years. And there's been a number of trips. He's been stopping water systems in Cuba and Guatemala, at least. And there are about eight others of us from the congregation. I won't try to mention the one right now. We come to the in this project. And my wife and I, at least, are going to start um, attending the Great Industrial Session of Clean Water University. Uh, which is a kind of preliminary to getting this started with the foundation. At the very least, there will be a few of us that will participate in this program in the coming months. Uh, and maybe it could turn into a lot more than that. For eight of us at the meeting um, a week ago, we could do it twice as many. Anyone who's interested could talk to me, to Sally, to he is, you see his wife, Gloria, who's not here this morning. She's watching. Yes. 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 Uh, so just be aware of that. And uh, as I, if this is something that interests you, providing clean water to the world, um, it, I, I should say it's the Presbyterian ministry that is uh, associated with um, churches and Christian schools in far off places, mostly Guatemala, and the reason we're going to start that's what people most familiar with. Just um, be aware of it. Be aware of the buzz in the congregation. Are there any other announcements for the good of the community gathered?
the waters of baptism, the old life dies away and a new life emerges. The scriptures, we remember what God has done and hear God's promise to us. The table of the Lord, the gifts of God for the people of God. Good morning. Please join me in the call to worship. Jesus invites us to a way of celebration, meeting and feasting with the humble and poor. Jesus beckons us to a way of risk, letting go of our security. Jesus challenges us to listen to the voices of those who have nothing to lose. Jesus points to a way of self-giving where power and status are overturned. Jesus calls us to follow the way of the cross where despair is transformed by the promise of new life.
Please join me in the prayer of confession. Lord Jesus Christ, we call you Lord, yet it is too easy for us to worship other things, other activities, other relationships, other gods. You tell us we cannot serve two masters, yet we spend more time focusing our energies elsewhere, diverting our time, our energy, our money, our attention away from you. Forgive us, gracious Savior, when our hearts are led astray, when we serve other gods and worship them. We turn away from our distractions and sin. Strengthen us to set our faces toward Jerusalem, to take up our cross and follow you. We open our lips and confess our hearts. God hears our words and makes us new, sending us out to bring hope and joy to all the world. We hear the good news. We believe the good news. We will live out the good news. Thanks be to God. Amen. Please take a moment to pass the peace of Christ.
this time I'd like to invite any of the other children who are here to come forward. You okay? Good morning. morning. How are you guys doing today? Good, good. You guys excited about more snow? Not very. (laughs) We're going to be good friends then. We're going to be good friends. All right, so, hey, I want you guys to do me a favor. You see that picture up there on the screen up there? It's also like this picture here on our bulletin, right? It's this bowl, and you see these lines in it? In, in the picture on the bulletin, you can't see it. You see these cracks and stuff? Do you know what those are filled with? You can see it better on the picture up there what color those are. Do you know what those are filled with? Lava. Lava. That'd be cool, but it's not lava. It's gold. And the story is that somebody took this pot and they dropped it, and it broke. And they didn't want to throw it out because it was their favorite pot. So what they did was they put... They put gold in it. They melted down gold, and they used the gold to hold the pot together, so it was even more pretty. Isn't that crazy? Do you know know why they do that? You know what else they think it symbolizes? It symbolizes sometimes that we're broken in our lives, that sometimes sometimes bad things happen to us or we get hurt, and that, that we shouldn't necessarily hide it, but that God puts us... Yes, go ahead. You could break your heart, right? Sometimes our hearts get broken. You guys will find that out when you get older, trust me. You could break your skull, right, yeah. But, but when we're put back together sometimes, it, we, it doesn't, it's not a bad thing. It's not something that we should hide necessarily. That all of us sometimes, we get broken and we're in need of repair, right? What do you think, what do you think if our hearts break? What do you think repairs our hearts? God does, right. Right. What do, you think, what do you think God uses to fix our hearts? He doesn't use gold. What, what does God use? A Not a hammer. That's why we don't let you fix anything at the house, Isaac. I think, I think he, um, I think I know, um, well, because I think he gives you more blood to put back your heart together. Kind of, yep, yep. But he also gives you love. Yep. Love helps fix broken hearts. And love helps fix broken lives. Right? And that's what the story of Jesus and is about. That people and help and, and hurting people also help people. And, and crying helps people too. Crying helps people too. That's right. That's right. And we're supposed to help crying people by loving them. All right? Because that's what Jesus taught us to do. Sound good? Yeah. If you love someone when they're dead, that's a great question for your Sunday school teacher. I think you should ask them. No, they won't come around. <laughs> uh, no. But no, that's only, if they, only if they go to hospital and they, you, you cry them out. That's true. If you're physically and, hurt, you should go to the hospital. And do, and, um, and do their x-ray and see if there's, like, if their heart is broken. And you know those little, like, things that come to your heart to make you back alive? Uh-huh. That's right, that's right. If if you're physically hurt, go see a doctor and let your parents know. But if your heart is broken or you're feeling sad or hurt feeling-wise, God's a good place to turn. All right, let's say a prayer, okay? We're going to say a prayer, all right? All right, let's pray. Hold on, let's, let's pray. God, we thank you that you put us back together when we're hurt or when we're broken and that you give us doctors that also help us put us back together when we're broken physically. And we ask that you bless us that we might help love other people and that you bless doctors and nurses and all those in the care profession that they might help put people back together too. In Christ's name we pray, amen. I don't know. That would be great.
Please be seated. Join me in the prayer for illumination. Unstop our ears, O God, that we may hear your word proclaimed this day. Open our minds and hearts to be changed. Free us from the unclean spirits of worry, fear, destruction, and pride. Teach us, Lord, that we may follow you more faithfully. Our first scripture reading this morning is taken from Isaiah, chapter 45, verses 1 through 9. Thus says the Lord to his anointed, to Cyrus, whose right hand I have grasped to subdue nations before him and strip kings of their robes, to open doors before him, and the gates shall not be closed. I will go before you and level the mountains. I will break in pieces the doors of bronze and cut through the bars of iron. I will give you the treasures of darkness and riches hidden in secret places so that you may know that it is I, the Lord, the God of Israel, who call you by your name. For the sake of my servant Jacob and Israel, my chosen, I call you by your name. I surname you, though you do not know me. I am the Lord, and there is no other. Besides me, there is no God. I arm you, though you do not know me, so that they may know from the rising of the sun and from the west that there is no one besides me. I am the Lord and there is no other. I form light and create darkness. I make wheel and create woe. I, the Lord, do all these things. Shower, O heavens, from above and let the skies rain down righteousness. Let the earth open that salvation may spring up and let it cause righteousness to sprout up also. I, the Lord, have created it. Woe to you who strive with your maker, earthen vessels with the potter. Does the clay say to the one who fashions it, what are you making, or your work has no handles? Before we read the gospel, we should recognize that Tom is a new grandfather again. So, give him congratulations. Our gospel reading this morning comes from the gospel according to Mark chapter 8, verses 27 through 38, and that can be found on page 43 of the New Testament, or 53 if you are using the large print. Again, that's Mark chapter 8, verses 27 through 38 on page 43 or page 53 of the large print. I invite you again to listen to the word of our Lord as it may speak to us at this time and in this place. Jesus went on with his disciples to the villages of Caesarea Philippi. And on the way, he asked his disciples, who do people say I am? And they answered him, John the Baptist, and others, Elijah, and still others, one of the prophets. He asked them, but who do you say I am? Peter answered him, You are the Messiah. And he sternly ordered them not to tell anyone about him. Then he began to teach them that the Son of Man must undergo great suffering and be rejected by the elders, the chief priests, and the scribes, and be killed, and after three days rise again. He said all this quite openly, and Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him. But turning and looking at his disciples, he rebuked Peter and said, Get behind me, Satan, for you are setting your mind not on divine things, but on human things. He called the crowd with his disciples and said to them, If any want to become my followers, let them deny themselves and take up their cross and follow me. For those who want to save their life will lose it, and those who lose their life for my sake and for the sake of the gospel will save it. For what will it profit them to gain the whole world and forfeit their life? Indeed, what can they give in return for their life? Those who are ashamed of me and of my words in this adulterous and sinful generation, of them the Son of Man will also be ashamed when he comes in the glory of his Father with the holy angels. Friends, this is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. 
I'm going to ask your forgiveness right off the bat this morning. I'm going to talk about this Japanese method of fixing pottery that I was telling the kids about, and I'm going to butcher these Japanese words. Most places, I wouldn't really worry about it, but knowing my luck, someone like Jim McNabney, who speaks 5,000 different languages, is going to be fluent in Japanese here. So if you are one of those people here who speaks Japanese, what I'm sorry for what I'm about to do to this beautiful language. As I was telling the kids this morning, and the black and white photos don't show this well on the front of our bulletins, but up on here on the screen is this, this tea bowl, and those veins you see running through them are gold. It's a bluish bowl with these gold veins. I don't care what Facebook tells you. It isn't a blue bowl with black veins. <laughs> it's a bluish bowl with gold veins. And I picked this image way before the whole dress controversy ever came up. Anyways, what has happened here, at some point, the bowl was dropped or something happened to it. And it broke into a bunch of tiny pieces. And instead of throwing it out, the Japanese practice this technique called kintsugi or kintsukorai, which means gold joinery or gold repair. If you get online and you just simply search Japanese gold repair pottery, you'll, be, you'll find hundreds of images for it. And they're absolutely stunning, some of them. Beautiful pottery with these gold webbings and, and, and veins running all throughout them. It makes for some really remarkable art. They do this because of a philosophy they have called wabi-sabi, which I think is my new favorite word now, wabi-sabi. Not to be confused with wasabi, which is something that you put on sushi, but wabi-sabi. And it essentially means the embracing of something that is flawed or imperfect. And they believe then that, that the cracks in the wear of something shows the life that it's had and the value that it holds for its owner. The cracks and repairs are events in the life of the piece of pottery, not the end of a piece of pottery. It's a part of its history and who it is, essentially. The idea is behind this that if you can treat your pottery with that same respect and lead that into your life, then maybe you can understand your life in the same way. Last week, we talked a bit about the brokenness of life and, and how God can use us in our brokenness, how God in somehow and in some way takes the broken pieces of our lives and uses them to make the world whole. In essence, that's what Wabi Sabi is, is saying. Being broken and then getting repaired is a part of life, not the end of it, and that it's nothing to hide. The fact, in fact, it's to be celebrated and embraced and admired. Because even though something was once shattered, it's been repaired and, and put back to good use. And sometimes it makes the object more beautiful. In the Wikipedia article I read about this, because despite the facts, I'm not an expert in Japanese pottery, it said that when this first method was first developed, people would go home and purposely smash things in order to get the kintsugi done because they thought it was so pretty and they thought it added such value and character to their pottery. We don't live in a culture, in a society like that. Usually when things get broken or lost, we just throw them out or replace them. Or if we do repair them, we, we do our best to repair them in the broken parts and hide them so no one will notice. They become objects of shame. My favorite sweater in the entire world had bleach stains and holes and was worn thin. And I somehow have not seen it since I have moved. <laughs> my mother and my wife hated it to the point where they called it my homeless sweater. They were embarrassed by it to the point where my mom would demand that I leave it at home, even if it was in the middle of July. She said, if you're coming over, you're not bringing that sweater, are you? But that sweater and I had some good history and good memories together. Unfortunately, we do the same things with people, too. We tell people all the time that they need to be perfect, have perfect white teeth, have perfectly smooth skin, have perfectly silky hair, or even have hair, have a perfectly flat tummy, 
be perfectly successful and perfectly dressed. We don't want to see your, your flaws and your scars. People, they don't want to see the broken parts. They don't want to see what has been fixed or, or what needs to be fixed even further. I had a seminary professor once tell me, he, he said that if I stood up in a pulpit and hinted that my life was less than perfect, I'd be run out of a church guess what? I'm not perfect. And I'm not the perfect husband. And I'm not the perfect father. And I'm not the perfect minister. But I think his point was more that no one wants to see the broken parts. We're supposed to hide them and to tuck them away. Now, I want you to do me a favor this morning. On the count of three, I want you to take a deep breath and then let it out, okay? One, two, three. You aren't perfect either, and we already know it, and you don't have to be perfect, and you don't have to pretend to be perfect here. Isn't that a relief to know that there's at least one place in our lives where we don't have to pretend to have it all together? Because this is a community that celebrates repairs to the broken. We are a wabi-sabi community. Wabi-sabi Westminster Presbyterian Church. (laughs) Has a nice ring to it. But doesn't that take the pressure off just a little bit? I mean, you see, I I think the truth is, is that we can better see where God is in our lives when we show the places where we've been broken and then we've been repaired. When we see the stretch marks of faith the wrinkles of prayers hard prayed, the scars of the sacred running like veins all throughout our lives where we've been broken and God has put us back together. If we hide them, if we let people think that we're perfect, we're hiding the evidence of God working in our lives. And what's scary about that is then they might not see the evidence of God working in their lives. But if we show them our kintsugi, our broken repairs, well then, then who knows? Our theme for Lent is God the potter, we the clay. I'm going to be saying that a lot. And the question might be, if God's a potter and we're the clay, then what is the gold stuff in between holding all of it together? And the answer to that is that it's love. That's God's love and the love that other people have for us. That's that's part of the reason why we shouldn't hide that stuff and hide that it's there. People need to see that. They need to see God's love and the love of other people in someone's life. And I really believe then that that's, that's how broken things get repaired. It's through love. It's through God's love and the love of other people that broken people and broken communities and broken worlds get put back together again. And it might not look exactly the way that it once did, but what you might find is that it becomes more beautiful than it ever was before. And you see, the thing is, is that we see Christ telling us here in Mark, right before he's about to go on and be broken, to go lose your life for the sake of the good news. And the good news is love. And Jesus is telling us to go out and give ourselves for that love, to go give of ourselves without hesitation, to love people wastefully, to go show people the brokenness you once were and how God's love has put you back together. If we want to know how the broken parts of our lives get fixed, it's through love. And sometimes the best way to see and to know that you are loved is to go love other people. Christ calls us to go love all people. Broken people. Hated people. People that we aren't supposed to like. If we don't want to be broken anymore, then we give our lives for others. We have to live for something bigger than ourselves. We have to live for Jesus Christ and for his gospel. 
which is this radical notion of loving despite all odds. Loving against any other message. And loving through all brokenness. Because that love is the gold that puts us back together again. And that love, it's so beautiful, it's hard to believe that people want us to hide it behind white teeth and shiny hair and nice clothing. Because the truth is, is you can't hide that you're not perfect. And the truth is, you're not really supposed to. Because the truth is, the gospel of Jesus Christ is being written and lived through those golden veins that run throughout our lives. That's where the gospel is being lived. Don't be ashamed to show people how God is working in your life. Show them that you're a wabi-sabi Christian. Show them God's kintsugi on your life. Show them the love of Christ that's so freely been given to you through your love for them. And I promise you, I promise you, if you do that, you'll find your life repairing and becoming more whole, and those golden veins will become even more rich in your life. I'm not saying that your bills will be paid and your teeth will whiten. I'm saying that your heart will grow. And I'm not saying that you'll then hurt less. I'm saying that you'll hurt for the right reasons. And Jesus isn't saying that you'll gain the world. But he's saying that if you lose your life, if you give it up freely, then you end up saving it in the long run by becoming whole again. The truth is nothing gets better until something changes. And maybe the change that we desperately need in our culture, in our society, is to stop hiding it and to show the seams of gold that run throughout our lives. The change comes when we realize all the places that God is putting us back together through love. And it's my firm belief then that when we see how truly loved we are about how much gold actually runs through us, then we can't help but share that love in, with everyone else and to help them then see the love in the gold that runs throughout their lives. God is a potter. We are the clay. And the love of God is the gold running through our cracks, holding the whole thing together. So may you go knowing that you are so loved. May you go seeing all the places in your life God has repaired and restored you through the love of Jesus Christ. And may you go showing off the brilliance and the beauty of God in your life to everyone else so that they may see it in their own lives as well. Amen. This time I'd like to invite Annie Peterson to come forward for our moment for mission. Good morning. Um, I'm Annie Peterson. I'm the youth director here, so I work with the 7th through 12th graders, and I am here today to talk to you a little bit about a youth mission trip that our um, high school youth will be taking this summer. We plan to take 15 youth to Hastings, Michigan to serve God and serve others by repairing and rebuilding low-income housing. They will have the opportunity to grow in their faith and deeper their relationships with other Christian youth while they're there. Um, we have set a goal for ourselves to fundraise $3,000 in order to take this trip. We have to pay for transportation and food and lodging and all of the other aspects that come with a, a week-long trip with 15 kids. So we have several fundraisers. If you so feel inclined to help us raise that $3,000, one of them 
is an envelope board that is in the hallway between South Hall and Fellowship Hall. And what it is, is there's envelopes that, I'm sure you've seen it, all look like this, and they each have a number on it, and then they have a spot to write your name. You can pick down whatever amount you feel like you can give, whether it's $10 or $60 or $1, and then you either put cash or a check inside. Checks can be made to Westminster. Um, and if you do write a check, make sure to say that it's for the mission trip. And then you can either just put that into the offering plate or in the front office. And all the proceeds, again, will help the mission trip. But if you feel like you want to be more active or more hands-on, we are also having a pancake breakfast in which the youth will serve you pancakes and talk to you about you know, their hopes and, and goals for the mission trip. That will be Sunday, March 15th. So before, during, and after worship, depending on which service you go to, obviously this one, you can come after this service or before this service for pancakes. There will be a free will donation for that. It's all in the bulletin, but again, it's on March 15th. So I, I hope that you do feel inclined to help our youth have an experience that will really change their lives. So thank you. Sisters and brothers, God's ancient steadfast love is not a love that simply waits for us to stop wandering and to return home. God's love comes seeking us and gives us the gift of Jesus so that we might have life and have it abundantly. Our giving this morning, then, whether we've been lost and wandering or secure and safe, expresses our firm conviction that God is with us no matter what. Our offering is an act of worship in which we express our reliance and gratitude on God. For those of you who are guests with us today, giving is not obligatory. We are eager to share with you more about our church and its ministries and to invite you to participate with us as you are called by God. And let us now gather our gifts together and offer them to God in gratitude, heartfelt commitment, and praise.
please join me in the prayer dedication printed in our bulletin this morning. Hearing the witness of your prophet Isaiah, O Lord, help us to cease to do evil, but rather learn to do good. Lead us to seek justice, rescue the oppressed, defend the orphan, plead for the widow. Teach us the wise use of the resources you provide, both personally and as a congregation. We dedicate these offerings to your glory and our neighbor's good. In Jesus' name, amen. Please be seated. Jesus said, I am the gate. You will come in and go out, and you will find pasture. At this table, Christ opens the door for all people, asking us all to come in and inviting us to be nourished. At this table, it doesn't matter if we have denied, betrayed, forgotten, or turned away. Christ bids us to come. At this table, we don't need to understand. We only need to be open to love. At this table, we don't need to be Presbyterian. We'd all think alike. All we need is to hear the voice of the Good Shepherd calling us to enter and to be fed. At this table, we are filled with the good gifts of God so we can go out then and feed others. At this table, Christ is the host, and each one of us is a treasured guest. So come, for you are invited to come in and go out and be fed. Let us pray. Lift up your hearts. Give thanks to God, for the Lord is good. We come to this meal of Jesus, yearning to be fed, eager to be loved. God's love we find ourselves. Let us pray. It is truly right and our greatest joy to give you thanks and praise, O Lord, our God, creator of the universe. For you worked in the darkness to bring all life into being and to bring new life through Jesus Christ, your Son. Out of that darkness, you bring marvelous light again and again. When we shield our eyes, unwilling to see what you are doing, still you work. When we shut the doors, unafraid to step into your new world, still you work. When we deny and betray with words and actions, still you work. And so we give you thanks, O God, that your love does not depend on our faithfulness, that your saving grace does not depend on our worthiness. You are the breath of life, the light of the world, giver of every good gift. As we come to your table of grace filled with bounty, we cannot forget the emptiness that plagues so many bellies, the hunger of our neighbors near and far. We cannot forget the rawness of your earth exploited for our gain and groaning under our weight. We cannot forget the world at war. We cannot forget the world preparing for war, and we beg for peace. We cannot forget those who suffer at the hands of those who should love them. We cannot forget those who feel trapped in the tomb with no hope of life ahead. We pray that you would come quickly, Lord, with good news for this troubled world. Come quickly, Lord, with your spirit of justice and peace. As you rose in the darkness to bring about a new thing, rise again in our darkness, bringing light that dispels the shadows of despair. As we come to your table of grace, may we hear again your call to be made one and to show the world your love in our every action and every word. Send your spirit again to this place, that just as many grains become one bread, Many grapes become one cup. We who are many may become one with you 
with your people in every time and in your, every place. May this feast nourish us for your kingdom. And may your kingdom come here and now. We pray all these things in the name of Jesus the Christ, who is victorious over death and who calls us by name. Amen. The Lord Jesus, on the night of his arrest, took bread, and after giving thanks and praise for it, he broke it, and he gave it to the disciples, saying, Take and eat this. This is my body. It's broken for you. And so every time you eat of it, do so in remembrance of me. The same way, at the end of this meal, he found a cup on the table, he took the cup, and after saying a prayer and blessing it, he poured it out, saying, This cup is the new covenant, sealed in my blood, shed for the forgiveness of your sin. Whenever you drink of it, do so in remembrance of me. And so we gather to eat this bread and drink from this cup in remembrance of our Lord who has died, who has risen, and who will come again. Family, these are the gifts of God. For the people of God, thanks be to God. This time I'd like to ask our communion service to please come forward.
cup of salvation. Before we close out in prayer, I, I do know of a few prayer requests that we, we should have. Uh, Tom Jenkins has lost his mother this week and uh, is with her and traveling back, so um, we need to pray for Tom and his family. And also, Katie Brown Boyle and her father lost a brother and an uncle uh, this week as well, so we need to keep them in our prayer, the Brown family in our prayer as well. Uh, are there any other joys or concerns for the good of the community this morning? Anybody we need to hold up in prayer? Let us pray. Almighty God, we come to you today in confidence, for this world in which we live is your world, brought into being through your love for all people. As we bring all our concerns before you, we know that you are waiting to hear us and to respond to us. Lord, we pray that you will teach us all how to provide for our own lives, mindful of our needs and also of the call of Christ to put our trust in Him. Help us to spend our time and our money in a manner worthy of Your kingdom of love. Lord, make this church a place of generosity where people work together, giving all that they are and all that they have so that the wonderful resources of our world might be shared. We pray today for people who wander through life, constantly seeking a purpose, a reason for living. We remember especially those who store up wealth for themselves, believing that the road to happiness is through the accumulation of possessions. Help them to find in you love, acceptance, and wholeness. We make all our prayers as part of our common life of worship and service to Christ our Lord, who taught us to pray together as one family praying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not to temptation, but deliver us from evil. Thine is kingdom and the power. And now, dear friends, I commend you to God in the word of God's grace, which is able to build you up and give you an inheritance among all those who are sanctified. In the name of God, and of Jesus, and of the Holy Spirit, now and forever.